Good morning, I'm Mr. Priscilla with my Math 1314 class. Today we're going to discuss functions and domains of functions. Uh, let's start off with the definition, why don't we? Definition. A relation, R-E-L-A-T-I-O-N, like a relative, is a set of ordered pairs. Nothing special about the ordered pairs, just any set of ordered pairs. And here's an example of a relation. I'm going to name it R1. Let's see. There's an example of a relation. Any set of ordered pairs. In this case, there's four ordered pairs. Or here's another relation. I'll name it R sub 2. Let's see. second relation only has three ordered pairs. A special type of relation is a function. So here's the next definition. A function is a relation. So a function is a set of ordered pairs in which there's no repeated x coordinate. So a function is a set of ordered pairs with no repeated I'll just say x values for brevity I say brevity is the soul of wit so I'll be brief there a function is just a set of ordered pairs where there's no repeated x values. If you understand what that's saying, you can answer the next question. One of the relations I wrote up there is a function. Which one is a function? R1 or R2? R1, I agree. R1 is a function. Notice every one of those x values is different. But looking at R2, we have repeated x values. We have a 3. Here 3 is assigned to positive 6. Here 3 is assigned to negative 6. So R2 is not a function. Not a function. The domain of a relation is the set of all numbers that are used as x values. We mentioned this the last time in the last homework assignment. So let me move it there. Okay. The domain is the set of all numbers that are used as x values. So I'll just say it's the set of all x values and the range is the set of all y values. Let's look at, mm, let's say, uh, R1. If I wanted the domain of R1, the domain of R1, what numbers are used as x values in R1? 3, yeah, 3 is used. 4, 5, 6, I agree. 3, 4, 5, and 6. That says that those four numbers are used as x values. Looking at R2, well, suppose I wanted the range of R2. Which numbers are used as y values. Realize the domain and range doesn't tell you how many times the number is used. It just says that it's used. So what numbers were used as y values for R2? 
oh wait a minute there, I was thinking they had repeated y's but no they don't okay so it's six negative six and eight we don't have to put them in numerical order we're just listing the numbers and one more still looking at r2 suppose I wanted the domain of r2 domain of r2 this is where I should be saying the domain of range doesn't tell you how many times it's used it just says the numbers used so which numbers are used as x values in r2 three and four well three is used twice but we don't list it uh, twice if there are some problems in my math lab where you're listing out the domain if you've listed it twice they'll actually tell you no don't list it twice the little hint they tell you is actually helpful when they say no the answer is not right you don't need to list the repeat in, to repeat the number more than once so with that in mind let's see with all of that in mind Let's look at number one. I printed out the homework assignment, and so let's look at number one. Determine whether the relation is a function and give the domain and range. Okay. Looking at number one, do y'all see that uh, this diagram is a diagram like this is referred to as a mapping, and they're trying to uh, show ordered pairs. Do y'all see the ordered pairs that are being generated? This is saying the number 10 is assigned to 5, so we have the ordered pair 10, 5. What's another ordered pair that's being generated? 3 is being assigned to 25, I agree, and... And 15 is being assigned to 5. So, first question, uh-oh, well, is this, a, uh, is this relation a function, yes or no? Yes, there's no repeated x values. Each x value is different. So, yes, it is a function. And they want us to state the domain and range. Okay, and they tell us to, they're giving us the braces, so we don't have to type the braces. All we have to do is type the numbers, and they say to use a comma to separate those numbers. So what's going to go inside that blue box for the domain? Okay, 10, 3, and 25. No, you're right, I'm 15, I'm sorry, 15. 10, 3, and 15. Thank you for correcting that for me. What about the range? Okay, 5 is used and 25, so I agree. Once again, we don't repeat the 5. The domain and range just says that the number's being used. It doesn't say how many times it's being used. Any questions there? Okay, and number 2. Here they're giving it to us explicitly as order pairs. Same instruction, state the domain and range. Is this a relation a function? What do you think? No, you think it's not a function? So, no, nah, it's not a, a function. What's wrong with it? Why is it not a function? Okay, we have repeated x's here and there okay the x values are being repeated notice the y values are repeated also but the function that's perfectly fine you can have repeated y values you just can't have repeated x values so what about the domain what's going to go inside this blue box Four twenty-eight. okay any more 34, I agree, and 47. 4, 28, 34, and 47. We don't repeat the 4. The range? 8. Okay. 8 and negative 5, I agree. We've already got 8 listed once. Anything else? 2. 2 is used as a Y value as well.
Any questions there? Okay. Uh, the, I want to consider the. I want to consider the following graphs. Okay, consider the following graphs. I have two graphs. Ah, let me move that down. Okay, I have two graphs I want us to uh, look at. I think I'll just tear the paper off. Here's the first graph I want to look at. Mm -hmm. And here's the second graph. Mm -hmm. So we have two different graphs. One of those has repeated x values. Which one has repeated x values? The first one, I agree. This one has repeated x values. If you look, look at these two points on that purple graph right there. That point would have the coordinates 0, comma, a positive number. So here 0 is being assigned to a positive number. But down here, 0 is being assigned, this uh, number is below the x-axis, so 0 is being assigned to a negative number. We have the same, uh, the same x value being assigned to two different numbers. So I agree, this first graph I drew is not a function. There's something called the vertical line test, but the vertical line test if you can draw a vertical line so that it hits the graph in two or more spots, then the graph isn't a function. Here, the vertical line that's hitting it in two spots is the y-axis, but if that vertical line could have been anywhere there. It hits it twice, so not a function. Come over here. It doesn't matter where you draw that vertical line. Are you going to hit that graph more than one time? No, so this diagonal line, slanted lines, are functions. So this is a function. And we have a couple of graphs here I wanted to look at. This is stock numbers three and four. So they want us to decide whether the graph is a function, give the domain and range. Okay. So we have a slanted line. A slanted line. Is that a function? <laughs> yes, it doesn't matter where you try to draw a vertical line. Any slanted line is automatically going to be a function. So yes, it is a function. They want us to give the domain and range. Remember how we were finding the domain and range when we were looking at ellipses yesterday? Take this uh, blue curve. I'm making it, trying to make it a little more, uh, stand out a little bit more with that purple ink. Reflect it onto, for the domain, reflect it onto the x axis. That blue part, that purple part there gets reflected down here. This bottom part is reflected upward. Reflected onto the x-axis. What part of the x-axis is covered up? I guess a better question is, is there any part that wouldn't be covered up? Is there any number on the x-axis that's not used as an x-coordinate on that purple line? Do you agree this bottom half would cover up the entire right-hand side of the x-axis? What about this top half? It would come down, cover that left side, so is there any part of the x-axis that's not being covered? No, so the domain is all real numbers. 
and you have to write that, uh, type that in <laughs> using interval notation. Apply that same logic to the uh, range. Apply that to the uh, y-axis. Take this line, reflect it over onto the y-axis. Is there any part of the y-axis that wouldn't be covered? No. So what can we say about the range? The same thing. That's true for any diagonal line. Any diagonal line, will, or a sl by a diagonal I mean slanted. If it's a slanted line, the domain and range will automatically be all real numbers. It'll use up all the x values and it'll use up all the y values. Any questions there? Number four. They give us another graph. This is like that graph that I drew a moment ago, I guess, isn't it? Mm, decide whether the relation defined by a uh, the graph to the right gives a defines a function and give the domain of range. Is this a function. No, you can draw that vertical line and it's going to hit it twice. Right there, the y-axis, that vertical line, right there, or well, right there, the y-axis uh, hits it twice, but anywhere you draw a vertical line, it's going to hit the uh, graph twice. So no, it's not a function. The domain of range are interesting, though. What is the domain? What is the range? First of all, let me ask you something. Is there a point on this graph that has negative 8 as its x value? No. So the domain is not going to be all real numbers. What's the smallest? What's the smallest number that's used as an x value? What's the smallest x value on that graph? Negative three, I think, let's see, negative one. I think I agree with the negative three. It's sort of hard to see, but I agree. The smallest x value is negative three. If you took this graph and you reflected it on to the x-axis, if you reflected it on, it would start at negative three, and it would cover up to the right. Would it stop? No. So negative three is used, so I'd say the domain is the interval from negative 3 to positive infinity. That's saying that x can be any number greater than or equal to negative 3. Any questions on my logic there? And once again, we've typed intervals before in my math lab, so there's nothing you're going to be doing there typing in answers that you haven't seen before, okay? What about the range? The range is more interesting. Reflect the graph onto the y-axis. This little portion right here, it'd be reflected, it'd cover up that stretch of the y-axis. This thing, realize the graph keeps going and going. So this top half here, reflect it over, it's going to start covering the y-axis. Is it going to stop? No, so it's going to cover all of that. The bottom half, reflect it over starts covering this portion here. Does it stop? So what can we say about the range? Hmm? How could it hear you? Okay, all real numbers. Negative infinity to infinity. Any questions on our logic there? I remember we used to use a textbook that had us, uh, when they discussed functions, the section over functions was named functions and circles. Functions and circles. Here's the graph of a circle. And I thought it was just ridiculous grouping functions with circles. Is a circle a function? Is a circle ever a function? Can you draw a circle that would be a function? No, no matter what, it's going to fail that vertical line test. I thought that was just the most bizarre thing, the way the book grouped circles with functions. I don't know why they did it. The textbook author thought it was a good idea. Oh, let's
let's see. Okay, this little ordered pair definition of functions is fine, but we need to uh, realize that in most many cases, there are infinitely many numbers in the domain and infinitely many numbers in the range. So listing out all the possible ordered pairs is just not feasible. So we have the algebraic definition of function. Algebraic definition of function. A function, for our purposes, a function is an equation <coughs> that assigns each number in one set comma, this one set is called the domain comma to exactly one number in another set. You can't assign it to two numbers, it has to assign it to exactly one number in another set. And what's this other set called? The range? Okay. So I've just defined three terms. Functions, domain, and range. I should say I've just formally defined three terms. Okay, so a function is an equation that assigns each number in one set to exactly one number in another set. The domain is the first set, the range is the second set. Really, I should have said it's an algebraic equation. I'm going to write that. I like it like that. I like that. It's an algebraic equation. Well, 1 plus 2 equals 3 is an equation. But it's not an algebraic equation. An algebraic equation has what? What, what does an algebraic equation have? What separates algebra from arithmetic? When did it change in your mathematical career? When did it change from algebra to from arithmetic to algebra? The introduction of what? Hmm? Well, not exponents, no. Maybe it starts with a V. Variables. Variables, that's it, okay. So uh, when I say it's an algebraic equation, it means there has to be variables, okay. There has to be at least one variable. The domain value, the domain variable that's used most frequently is X. Although we could use anything. I use Q's for quantities in my business math classes. I use T for time. So it could be any variable. But the most common variable used for the domain values is X. What do you think? The, and that makes sense because the domain is the set of all X coordinates. What do you think is the most common letter they use to represent range values? Y, because the range is the set of all Y coordinates, but you can use any letter. I use P's for price, C for cost, R for revenue, P, capital P for profit for uh, uh, in my business math classes. So it could be any letter, but the most frequently used letter is Y. And we have something called function notation. With function notation, with function notation, In place of y, we write the notation f with x in parentheses. That's read as f of x. It's not saying f times x. It's read as f of x, a function of x. And that function notation gives us a nice shorthand. If I wanted... Mm, 
if I had the function instead of y, f of x equals 3x minus 8. And if I had f of x equals 3x minus 8, and I wanted to know what is the y value, what is the y value when x is equal to, oh, any number, I'll say 5. When x is equal to 5. Instead of writing out that uh, question, I could just say, find f of 5. This notation is saying, go to your function, and whatever variables, uh, whatever numbers inside the parentheses, that's what you replace your domain variable with. So we're coming up here. We're replacing x with 5. So we have a 3 times 5 minus 8. When you make the substitution, and close it in parentheses. And then that's just an order of operations problem. What is that? 15 minus 8, which gives me 7. So when x is 5, the y coordinate is 7. I just now created an ordered pair. The ordered pair I created was 5, 7. Any questions on function notation? To use function notation, the equation has to be, the f of x has to be by itself. So if you're going to write a function using function notation, you need to solve for y before you replace the y with the f of x notation. And to illustrate, I have, ah, I've already written the problems down. 5, 6, 7, and 8. I wrote down on my tablet beforehand, before class. And number five, they give us f of x equals negative 2x plus 3. They want us to find f of negative 1 half. That says go to f, wherever you see an x, plug in. negative one half okay so we'd have a negative two we're going to plug in a negative one half for x what's negative two times negative one half positive one plus three so f of negative one half is equal to four. So that's what you would type into the blue box on my math lab. Whatever's inside the parentheses, that's what you plug in for x. Looking at number six. Here's number six. They give us f of x equals negative 4x plus 7. They want us to find f of p. What's that telling us to do? We go to the function f. Wherever we see an x, we're going to plug in p. Okay, so that's just going to give us negative 4. Replace the x with the p plus 7. It's merely a change of variable. You just change the variable from x to p. Any questions? And that's what you would type in. What I boxed in is what you would type as your answer on my math lab. Number seven. <coughs> When using function notation, you take whatever's in the parentheses and that's what you plug in for x. So we come up here to negative 4x plus 5, and what are we going to plug in in place of that x? Okay, it doesn't matter how messy the stuff is in the parentheses, that's what you're going to plug in for x. So you have negative 4, plug in 
the 3b minus 4. And don't forget what? The plus 5. We still have a plus 5 stuck on there. So distributing the negative 4, we get a negative 12b and plus 16 plus 5. So what's my final answer then? Okay, I agree. So here's what you would type in your blue box on my math lab. And let's see, I had them. Let's see. So, no, I'd cut off the stuff here, but here's number seven. Inside that blue box right there, that's where you would type, what was it? Negative 12. Right there you would type the negative 12b plus 21. Nothing difficult to type in. Okay, suppose the function is represented using ordered pairs. How would you interpret function notation then? This is one of those that's just incredibly quick, but if you forget it, on the test, I mean, it's so easy to do that people forget how to do it on the test because they don't study the stuff because they glance at it, ah, yeah, that's right. But there's no, there's no x to replace with. Let's go back to number, let's see, where was it? Here it is, okay, here. Remember that first example with function notation that we did a few minutes ago. I said that we just created an ordered pair. When we found f of 5, we created an ordered pair. What was the ordered pair? 5, 7, 5 was assigned to 7. So 5 was assigned to 7 using this function. Think like that. f of negative 2. What's negative 2 assigned to? I heard it. 4. Negative 2 is being assigned to 4. So f of negative 2 is 4. Suppose they'd asked us to find f of 9. Suppose they want us to find f of 9. Suppose that instead of them saying f of negative 2, they'd ask for f of 9. Negative 5. Negative 5. I agree. The value of the function is just the y coordinate. Remember, f of x is just a fancy way of saying y. So, when x is 9, f and, uh, the y value is negative 5. Suppose they'd asked us for this. Suppose they'd asked for f of 10. Can we find that? Is 10, is there an order pair up here that has 10 as its x value? Mm -mm. 10 is not in the domain of the function. So we can't find that y value. Let's see, I would say that is undefined by the function they gave us. Because 10 is not in the domain of f. Any questions there? And let's see, I think we're ready to start domains of functions now. Yes, we're ready to start. Oh, before we look at domains of functions, now I have one other problem I want to look at. Give me a moment to get this ready. Here it is. Shuffling pages, here it is. This is like y'all's number nine. Before we look at the rules for determining the domains of functions, here's number nine. Here they give us a graph, y equals f of x, and they want us to use function notation to find the value of the function at certain x values. Keep in mind that for function notation, uh, when we're using function notation, the uh, uh, y value is the value of the function. What's f of negative 3? Here's negative 3 on the x value, I mean on the x axis. When x is negative 3, what's the y value? 
0, so right here inside this box we would write 0. What's f of 0? Okay, when x is 0, when x is 0, you move up to the graph and the y value is 6. I agree. What about f of 4? When x is 4, this is saying when x is 4, go up, what did you say? 2? Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. No. Does that look like 2 to y'all? Yeah, that looks like 2 to me. What about f of 6? When x is 6, you go up to that point, what's its y value? It's also 6, I agree. For my final answer, any questions there? Okay, and with that in mind, I want to discuss domains of functions. Domains of functions. Unless we're told otherwise, we're going to assume that the domain of a function is the set of all numbers that can be plugged in for x that will produce real numbers for y. It can't produce imaginary numbers. It can't produce undefined results. So I'll say the domain of a function is the set of all real numbers that when substituted for x, that sounds better than plugged in, that when substituted for x produce real numbers And right here, I'm going to make a parenthetical statement, not imaginary. You don't want imaginary y values, not imaginary, and you don't want uh, undefined results, so not undefined, so it produces real numbers for y. So whenever you're plugging a number in for x, you need to get a real number back for y. You don't want an imaginary number. So what are the things we want to avoid? How do we produce imaginary numbers? How do you produce an imaginary number? More, more, what is, negative, you're right. There has to be a negative, but where does that negative occur? under a square root, so you want to avoid the square root of negative numbers. Okay. When do we get undefined results? We'd be dividing and under certain circumstances we'd get an undefined result. What was it? Zero in the denominator. Okay, those denominator cut points. Those are the two things we want to avoid. We want to avoid square roots of negatives. We want to avoid denominators of zero. Look at number 11. I want us to find the domain of this function. Find the domain of the function. Will this function ever produce imaginary numbers? No. If, in order to produce imaginary numbers, what has to appear? A square root. When I saw that there was no square root here, I knew there wasn't going to be imaginary numbers. Will it ever produce uh, undefined results? Will you ever get a denominator of zero? No, it's not those inequalities, those rational inequalities versus the polynomial inequalities. We're finding the uh, denominator cut points. No denominators, so you'll never have a denominator of zero. Therefore, 
neither of those circumstances is going to occur, so what can we uh, conclude about the domain? It's all real numbers, except those that produce imaginary or undefined results. If neither of these circumstances occur, what can you conclude? all real numbers. The domain is all real numbers, unless you're told otherwise. I remember years ago walking past a colleague's class and hearing him uh, telling this class, no square root, no denominator, the domain is all real numbers. And yeah, unless you're told otherwise, and I say that because in my business math class, we're always uh, being told, okay, the domain is x greater than or equal to 100 or something. So uh, unless the problem specifically tells you otherwise, if you're just finding the domain and they didn't say there's a restriction on the domain, this domain would be all real numbers. Okay. Number 10. Oh, and by the way, if you look at number 11, here's number 11 in the homework. There's number 11 in the homework. So you don't have to type in the answers. Which one would you choose as the domain, A, B, C, or D? B, we said it was all real numbers. I agree with response B. So you click B, and it'd say, oh, great, and you move on. Now number 10. I tell you right now, this domain is not going to be negative infinity to infinity. There are two things that we have to avoid. Square roots and negatives, denominators of zero. So looking back at this, will this function ever produce a square root of a negative? No, no because there's no square root. Will we get a denominator of zero? Yes, we don't want, remember how we would find those denominator cut points in earlier lessons, I'd say the denominator, we don't want that to be zero, so that means x cannot equal what? 10. So that's saying x can be anything except for 10. The domain is all real numbers except for 10. You can plug in any number you want to, all real numbers except 10. But, when we look at number 10 on my math lab, they're going to want the uh, domain in terms of interval notation. So, can y'all see that? Which one of those intervals would represent, would, uh, is saying all real numbers except for 10? B, I agree. Look at this. Notice we have parentheses after the 10 and a parenthesis before the 10. So that's saying we're not including 10. This is saying all the numbers to the left of 10. Over here we're saying all the numbers to the right of 10, just not including 10. I agree with response B. So written using interval notation, written using interval notation, I would say that's negative infinity to 10. Notice it's all parentheses, 10 to infinity. That's how they want it for my math line. Personally, I would like it better if they made you write it out in words, but they don't. Any questions there? Keep in mind when you're finding domains, there are two things you want to avoid. You want to avoid imaginary y values. You want to avoid undefined y values. Imaginary y values occur when the when you have a square root with a negative underneath it. Undefined y values occur when you have denominators of zero. Here's number 12. Find the domain. It's not going to be all real numbers. In this case, will the function produce imaginary numbers? No, because there's no square root. Will it produce undefined results? Yes, it'll, uh, in two instances. Neither denominator can be zero, so we can't let 
x minus 12 be 0, which means x can't equal 12. We can't let x minus 6 be 0, so x can't equal 6. So you can plug in anything you want to for x except for which two numbers? 12, 12 and 6. So the domain, if you wrote it out in words, would be all real numbers except 12 and 6. You can plug in any other number you want to. Well, how would you say that using interval notation? All real numbers except for 12 and 6. D, let's see. Okay, yeah, I would agree with D. This first interval is saying all the numbers to the left of 6. What's this middle interval saying? All the numbers between 6 and 12. What's this right-hand interval saying? Okay, all the numbers greater than 12. But notice the parentheses. We're not including 12. We're not including 6. I agree with response D. So if we were writing it out in interval notation, if we were writing it out in interval notation, I'd write negative infinity up to 6. That's saying all the numbers to the left of 6. Or... All the numbers between 6 and 12, not including 6, not include, oops, not including 12, union the numbers to the right of 12. Any questions there? Number 13. Oh, and by the way, number 13 is a free form one. It's not a multiple choice. You're going to have to type in the answer yourself, okay? We want to find the domain of f of x equals this. Yes, question. Why did you use a bracket on number. Did I? Number four. On number four? Uh, I, I don't know what number four was. Hold on a minute. Let me see. Mm. Ah, here, uh, let's see that we're looking for a domain. Is negative three being used? Is there a point? Here it is. Do I remember this problem? Is negative three <coughs> being used as an x value? Yes, it is. So we used a bracket. Over here, this is saying you cannot, there's no point that has 6 as an x-coordinate. There's no ordered pair that has 12 as an x-coordinate. And looking at number 13, f of x equals the square root of 14 minus 2x. Remember the two things we want to avoid. We want to avoid... We want to avoid imaginary, and we want to avoid denominators of zero. Do we have to worry about the denominator of zero situation? No. If I see a square root, I know that that could produce imaginary numbers. That's what we want to avoid. So what I do, when I see a square root function, I don't care what else is going on there. What's the smallest number you can have under a radical and it not be imaginary? Zero. Anything else is going to produce imaginary numbers. So I ask myself, when is the radicand equal to zero? Here's the question I ask myself. When is radicand, that's the thing under the radical, when is the radicand equal to zero? So we have a 14 minus 2x. When does that equal 0? Well, that's when x dividing by negative 2, we get when x is equal to 7. So then I draw myself a number line. There's my number line, and I'm looking at 7. I expect one, of the, one side of 7 to produce imaginary numbers. Either it'll be the left side or it's going to be the right side, but we, we don't know which one. We have to figure that out. 
So what I'm going to do, choose a number to the left of 7. Give me a number that's smaller than 7. Hmm? Zero. Zero? Okay, you could use 3. You could use uh, uh, negative 4 if you want to. Any number less than 7. So I'm going to test 0. If I plug in 0, if I plug in 0, I get, what, the square root of 14 minus 2 times 0, which is 0. That's the square root of 14. Is that imaginary? No, that's the square root of a positive number. So this side is okay. That's producing real numbers. Now suppose you had chosen the side over to the right of 7. Suppose you had chosen 8. Suppose you said, okay, I'm going to test over here. Plug in the 8. That's the square root of 14 minus... 2 times 8 is 16. That's the square root of negative 2. Is that a real number? No, that's the square root of a negative. This is the imaginary side. That's the side you don't want. All we have to decide now is, is 7 an acceptable x value? If you take 7 and you plug it in for x, Okay, we're coming up here to 7. We're going to try plugging in 7 for x. You're going to get a 14 minus what? 14. That's the square root of 0. What's the square root of 0? 0, that's, a, that's defined. That's the square root of 0. I mean, that's 0. So you get the ordered pair 7, 0. Therefore, 7 is acceptable. We'll include 7 in our final answer. Maybe I should have shaded. That's what we would do when we were using the cut point method. How do I express this interval using interval notation? This is the domain. These are the numbers. The numbers to the left of 7, including 7. How do we express that interval using interval notation? Negative infinity, comma, 7 bracket. Okay, negative infinity. Negative infinity, comma, 7 bracket. And what goes in front of the negative infinity? A parenthesis. I agree. You can plug in any number you want to that's to the left of 7, including 7. And in turn, you get a real number back for y, not an imaginary number. So here for number 13, here for number 13, you'd have to type in your domain. You type in the domain. What would go in this little box right here? That's where you would type your negative infinity, comma, 7, bracket. Any questions on why we're using 7? Why are we including 7? Why did we put a bracket there? Because it's okay to plug in 7. When you plug in 7, you get 0 for y. You can label that point on the xy grid, 7, 0. Yeah, it can be labeled. Number 14. Find the domain. Let me give you a moment to write the problem down. When I see a square root in my function, I know I have to be on the lookout for imaginary numbers. And that if I see a square root, that's the first thing I do. I deal with that square root. I see a square root. I don't want that, uh, that radical. Well, I don't want this thing to be negative here. So I take the radicand, x minus 14, and I ask myself, when does that equal 0? And that's at 14. So this is, I'm doing what I did with number uh, 13. With number 13, there, with number 13, I asked myself, there was a square root, I asked myself, when is the radicand equal to zero? I solved for x. And then, on one side of that number, I expect uh, imaginary numbers. So in this case, on one side of 14, I'm expecting imaginary numbers. There's 14. How can we decide which side produces imaginary y values? Test. What number do you want to test? 
2. Okay, 2 is over here to the left. Testing 2. We'd get a 1 over the square root of 2 minus 14. That's a 1 over the square root of negative 12. That 1 over doesn't really matter right now. What matters is this thing. Is that a real number or an imaginary number? Yeah. It's imaginary, so that means I don't want the left-hand side. Over here, I'm producing imaginary y values. Now that I know that this side isn't producing imaginary y values, what can I conclude here? Will this side produce imaginary y values? No, but let's go ahead and verify that. Give me a number right over to the right of 14. 15, okay. You get a 1 over 15, the square root of 15 minus 14. That's a 1 over the square root of 1. Is that square root of 1 imaginary? No, that's a positive number underneath there. So yes, this is acceptable. All we have to decide now is, is 14 an acceptable x value? If you come up here and you try to create an ordered pair, you're going to get a 14 comma. Plug in 14, four, you'd get a 1 over the square root of 0. What's the square root of 0? Zero? 0, 1 over 0, is that okay? Yes. 1 over 0 is okay? A number over 0? No, that's a thing you can't have. So no, that is not a number. This combines the imaginary situation with the undefined result. Okay, so we don't include 14. That's an open circle there. How would we express that shaded interval? How would we write this domain using interval notation? Parentheses, 14, comma, infinity, parentheses. Any questions on our logic there? What was the difference between 13 and 14? 14, you couldn't include that endpoint. You had a parenthesis. 13, we did include it. Notice we put a bracket. So what was the difference? What was the big difference there? Compare 13 and 14. Here's 13, here's 14. There's 13, there's 14. What's their big difference? Mm, let's see, here's 13 and there's 14. Hmm? What's, what's the big difference between 13, ah, 13 and 14? Here y'all said it's going to be, what, uh, 7, not 7, 14 to infinity. What's the difference? Why are we using a bracket there and a parenthesis there? Okay, one of those things is in a denominator. That square root is in a denominator. When you try to plug in 14, you get a 1 over 0. Remember, we want to avoid denominators of 0. Here, that radical wasn't in the numerator, I mean a denominator. We just had a square root of 0, and that's fine. It's when you have a fraction, you have to watch out for that denominator of zero. So number 14 involved both situations, imaginary numbers and square roots of, uh, and uh, denominators of zero. Any questions there? And we would choose, notice at this point, the multiple choice is getting trickier. There's the bracket, here's the parenthesis. They're expecting you to have the hang of when to use parentheses and when to use brackets at this point. Any questions there? So to figure out if you shade or don't shade, you just plug the number on the number line into the FFX? To see, do you get a real number okay. back? Okay. Yes. That's well said. One more, number 15. Find the domain. Will this function produce imaginary numbers? No, no it's not going to produce imaginary numbers. Will it produce undefined results? Remember the things we want to avoid. We want to avoid we want to avoid 
square roots and negatives and undefined results and yes it's going to produce denominators of zero that x squared minus 7x minus 8 we don't want that to be zero so we can factor this resist the 2 and 4 for 8 I think this is one of those times you'll have to use 8 and 1 what do we know about our signs here Okay, the second sign, that last sign, there's a minus. So we're going to have 1 plus and 1 minus. And let's see if we put the 1 there and the 8 there. Does that give us back the minus 7x when we foil it out? Yes. So what numbers are we going to get for x? The first one. So x can't be negative 1. The second one. x can't equal 8. So, x can be anything other than negative 1 or positive 8. So I'll say all real numbers except negative 1 and positive 8. And if you look, if you look at my math lab, I've here it is. It's not multiple choice. You're going to have to type in that interval uh, notation of representation. How would you type that using interval notation? It's easier to spot it when it's multiple choice. Which one is it saying? How do you type that? How do you type this uh, phrase, all real numbers except for negative 1 and positive 8, using interval notation? Parentheses, negative infinity, okay, keep going. Negative one. Union. Union, what goes after the negative one? The parentheses, union. Parentheses, negative one, comma, eight. Parentheses, union. Union. Parentheses. Yes. Okay. Very well said, okay. I was gonna suggest, if you were having trouble, I was gonna suggest, think about what it would look like on a number line. I was gonna suggest to get it written in interval notation, think about a number line. Here's a number line. You have negative one and you have positive eight. You don't have those, you can't use those numbers. Yet yeah, they're not shaded. But everything else is shaded. Everything else is shaded, they're shaded there and there. Negative 1 and 8 are not shaded, but everything else is shaded. So from negative infinity to negative 1, that's the first interval. From negative 1 to 8, that's the second. And from 8 to infinity, that's the third interval. I, I agree. So any questions there? Okay, that's, you know, I've got a lot to think about, don't you? Okay, well then, uh, I think that'll do it for this discussion on functions. I hope I, done, yeah, I did remember to hit record. Okay, so anyway, I'm going to let y'all go. This is Timothy Priscilla saying bye-bye.